honoured to be able to uh, welcome Matthew Gain, um, who is an alumni of the University of Newcastle here for an in-conversation. And the way we're going to run today's event is we've already formulated some questions for Matt, which I'll, I'll ask. Um, some of those we've incorporated from questions that people asked at registration, um, and then we'll open it to the floor a little later on. So if anyone's got any additional questions they want to ask, they can um, pick Matt's brain. Um, they but call me and give me a hard time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so it's like frenzy <laughs> in the audience. So hopefully they'll be friendly. Um, so it's delighted to welcome you back to Newcastle. Um, so for those of you uh, who aren't friends in the audience, can you explain a little bit about your connection to Newcastle and the University of Newcastle now? Sure. Um, and firstly, thank you very much for having me. I too will be voting yes, and so equally if anyone wants to speak to me, I'd like to encourage you to vote yes as well. So if I get an opportunity to change your mind, that would be great. Um, I'm, this is really exciting to be here and, um, and get a tour of I, I got here a little bit early this morning, so before you got a, a tour of this building and what a phenomenal facility and I think just a great space and some of the great stuff that this university is doing here. So, um, I was born, I got my dad here in the back of my cousin here in the middle of the <laughs> as well, so I'm a proud little Castrian. Um, and grew up here, um, went to school here, and then you know, had the opportunity to go to university here. I studied uh, a Bachelor of Arts Communications. Um, it was over at the Callahan um, campus. I think all the communication stuff is in the city here now. Yeah. Um, but um, back then it was over at the Callahan campus. So um, I completed that in the um, I think it's been 2001, the end of 2001. Yeah. Uh, and then um, you, you were at the same time. Same year. Yeah, okay, okay. Same degree. Right. Okay, right. Well, I'll we'll, we'll catch up. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, um, and so yes, that, that, that was my background at the university. I've always stayed in touch. I, I sat on the, um, the advisory board for that, uh, for that degree for many years. And more recently, now sit on the alumni advisory board, um, working with Christy and Bill here, and, and um, yeah, and many other great people on, on that. So um, I, I have a strong connection to the university. I think it's a fantastic university. It's underrated, uh, and I think that um, you know, when you see the stuff that this university is doing now, and facilities like this, you do recognise that the tree is a world class university. It's a world class university, a world class city. Yes. Um, do you miss uh, the beaches? Uh, now that you're overseas, I, in Berlin. I, I, I do miss the beaches, the <laughs> surf break at Berlin break wall. It's <laughs> <laughs> not so good. Um, there is waves in Munich, um, which is about five or six hours away on the river. And so the river runs really quickly there and they've, they've built up this way that's like a stationary way. Yeah, okay. So but that's, that's the nearest surfing. You can go all the way up to the Baltic Sea. Um, which is, the, you know, the, the, you know that we're Baltic, it's good Baltic in here, that, 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 so it's not going to be So we were doing a bit of backgrounding on you, Matt, um, mm -hmm. before you arrived, and there was a podcast you did with Rocket a little while back where you talked about your early experience. So you've done your degree at the university and you head down to agency land in Sydney. Yep. Um, and you were at Ogilvy um, PR working uh, there, and that really, I, from what I understand, provided you some really great creative freedom. Can you explain a little bit about what those first years post degree were like working in a creative agency or a variety of different creative agencies and, yeah. um, and what that experience was like from an Castrian people on the other things like? I, I was always, um, I think I've always been fascinated about um, moving to the place where decisions uh, are made, right? And I think that I've always wanted to understand how you grow you know, how, how do you be at the heart of where decisions are made? And so, in, in Australia, that's what I, I went to, to Sydney to work in business. I was like, I want to work in here, I want to be where, in the main, main centre in, in Australia. Um, and, and so that's why I went to Sydney. That's also why I kind of travelled around the world as well, because you find out that other oh, decisions, sure, they make some decisions here, but the bigger decisions are made somewhere else. <laughs> and then you get there and you realise, my oh, gosh, they made somewhere else. I hope I'll get to that. Like, Look behind the curtain, one day, but it's just the one person sat in there making a the decision. But um, I, I went to I went to Ogilvy PR, and I, I got very fortunate there because we won um, 
was some business in the video game space, and there was like in the business, there was a, you know, I've got Adam here in the audience who's worked in the VR agencies for a long time. And at that time, the industry, and still is to a large degree, is, is, is very female dominated, and um, and and at that time, I think this has probably changed a lot as well now. There wasn't so many women that were playing video games, and, and they were like, oh, you know, you're a boy, and you, you know a little bit about video games, and we work on this account, and it was, it was great because, you know, to your point, it gave me a lot of freedom in the sense that nobody else knew what to do, and so I was able, <laughs> what did I? But nobody knew, I didn't, no one knew better, and so I got to do a lot of things. That and, and make a lot of mistakes that nobody realised were mistakes, and I think that, that was great freedom to, to learn very quickly and adjust. And so yeah, I think that was a really it, it was a great opportunity to grow quickly. Um, it's kind of it's kind of interesting, right? Because the gaming sector is relatively new, um, not so much in the war, but back then it was quite a new industry and area um, of development. You kind of went from you know ping pong and Atari, and then all of a sudden the world changed. And so, how much do you think that's connected to the developments in technology yeah. and how rapidly they're changing or being introduced to markets and being adopted? And it allows you to make mistakes or yeah. take um, chances, yeah. particularly around communications and PR yes. uh, and branding opportunities. Yeah, I think that um, if I look back at my career, and I wasn't deliberate like this, Shimon. Um, and, but it's, it's easy to join the dots when you're looking backwards. I was lucky to get on to the rise of a couple of, a couple, a couple of things. You know, like video games, you, you're right, it wasn't new even, even in the early 2000s. But it was at that stage that it was becoming a massively mainstream industry. You know, it was out, you know, you launch a new game and without would sell the movies that were being released at that time. That was, we used to write a lot of press releases around, hey, the new, the, 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 um, this new game is going to make more money than any history and so I was able to ride that massive expansion of that industry there's a lot of money being invested in and that that's a great space to be in. any industry that's in a hyper growth phase creates enormous opportunities for all the people associated with that I then I, again not deliberately but I, I, I did a similar thing with social media and got into social media again you know I'll point out Adam in the audience that he and I worked very very closely in the early days of social media together and again, that was really exciting. My business was throwing a lot of money into that and trying to understand that you can make lots of mistakes, and, but the industry's growing so quickly that it's really exciting. And, and then, again, I've been lucky to, to ride the, the zeitgeist moment around the renaissance of audio and podcasting and, and all of that as well. So, um, yeah, get, get into an industry that's growing quickly. You can't, even your mistakes look good. So that's a nice little segue to your transition from um, PR and communications yeah. over to Audible. Can you explain what that transition was like and how, uh, I mean at that time I think it was an Amazon company yeah. already. Yes, it was. Um, so what was it like working from a sort of Sydney outpost of an Amazon company yeah. uh, riding that way? Yeah, just, I, I mean it was great. So I left. I loved working in agencies. I got to work with lots of different businesses. And then, you know, Zora's at the front work in agencies as well. I think that that's a great, it's a great experience to work with all of these different industries. Um, but I got to the point where um, it, it started to feel like we were just constantly competing with other businesses to grow. And um, I, I wanted a change. I think it was just ready for a change. And I, I, I wanted to work at one of the things, like so Facebook, Amazon, mm -hmm. Netflix, Google. Uh, and um, and you did me, it. Yeah, I did it. Yeah, <laughs> I did it. I made a deliberate play on that. And I, I thought that I would have to, I, I kind of wanted to get out of PR, but I thought I might be able to get into a marketing track, uh, a marketing role. And, um, and, this, and, and I was a subscriber of Audible already because I, I, I love reading books, but just never did. Because I had buy all these smart books, so very good at buying books, but my mind was like, just not very good at reading them. And, and then someone introduced me to Audible, and, um, and I was like, wow, it, was a little, it, it 
just put stories and books into my life because I could do it when I was working out, when I was commuting, when I was traveling, when I was driving. And, and so I was a fan of this business that not many people in Australia knew about. It had only just launched. And they had this role for the country manager and you know, that all, I don't they got any applications in there. Um, and it's a subscription business and I managed to convince the recruiter that, um, that a PR agency is a little bit like a, recruit, a subscription business um, because it's like, well, you've got, get, you've got your clients, you've got to get new ones in, you don't want to lose the ones we have been up before, so you're going to keep them happy. And he bought it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Do you think he knew a subscription business actually was? Well, he did, yeah. Maybe he didn't know how convincing a PR person would be. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and, yeah, so I got an opportunity to speak to um, my then boss, who was the head of Asia, and, um, and I, was, I, I think I was so passionate about the business that that really came through. And I had a lot of ideas for what we could do with the business, and then, uh, yeah, and then I got the job, and it was, it was surprising. A lot of people have kind of asked me that, like, how did you move from a, a, a communications field into a general management role? And I, d I don't have a great answer other than, I, I was a bright spot by time. But I was, I guess, leading an agency that was pretty big. I was leading it in Australia. And so that was, it was over 100 people. And so when you're, you're doing, running a business like that, you, you kind of are running a business, not, not doing PR. You know? you're, you're a business leader more than you are. The, 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 and I think that I was really nervous going into Audible because I was like, oh, God, like I've told you Am I going to be able to do this? And um, and again, an industry that was just taking off like a rocket, and so you, your mistakes were good. But we had a great team, and um, and we did a lot of really good stuff. And, and and there is a real commonality between if you can lead in one business, you can lead in another. I think, and so and that came through. You need to keep the team happy, make them successful, listen to them. Um, and surround yourself with great people and business doesn't come that far. Um, and so it wasn't too long before you uh, had your sights set, I guess, maybe you sussed out the Sydney Outpost and decided yep. another opportunity lay before you, a peek behind the curtain in another yep. area. Yep. So it was, how long were you in Sydney before you then made the jump? I think I was, I was in Sydney maybe um, almost four years in Sydney, but I, I, it was, about two years into my role, I took over the Asia Pacific region and we, we launched in India, which is just one of my favourite places to go to. I don't know if people have been in India, but if you get the opportunity, it's where I'm trying to be. No, I right. um, You need to go. <laughs> um, and it's just the colour there, the energy there, the vibrancy there, the, the sense of. Um, you, you, you know, I spoke, I've spoken a few times now about when a business is on the up, and like India is like a country that's on the up. So that's just it's like, it's that on a massive scale, like the biggest scale you can imagine, because there's more than a billion people there. Mm. And so and we launched in India, and that, and that was really great. And then we were having a really tough time in Japan. Like Japan is, oh my goodness. I was, I was just with a friend on, um, on the weekend just past, and she's Japanese, and we were talking about some in, like share stuff. She was asking, I, I, love, I love talking about shares and investments and stuff. And she was showing me some of her things, and I was looking at the, the charts, and I, and I was like, oh, that's doing really well. That's strange that that's doing really well, and that's doing really bad. And then I, then I remembered, over in Japan, like green is bad and red is good on the share charts. And I think that that's just a really great analogy to show that everything in Japan is top Everything, like what's right is wrong over there, what's left is right. And, um, and we were just doing a really bad job in Japan. And, um, and I, everything we were doing was wrong. And I would go up there a lot. I, I used to go up there once a month. And I'd go up there going, oh, this they're, they're going to do this really strange thing. And you get there and you're like, that's dumb. And they're like, yeah, we know it's dumb, but it's dumb because of this strange, dumb reason. And you kind of feel like, oh, that makes sense. 
And so when I was up there, I, I started to understand more about the business. But I was in and out, like I was there maybe once a month for a week. And so I convinced my boss that I needed to be there. I said, if we want to be successful in Japan, I can't manage the team by the year conference. And so I finally convinced my boss that I needed to move there and convinced my family. Um, but it wasn't that hard because they were really excited about life's been And so we moved to Japan in January 2020. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then I managed the team by video conference. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <in> Japan. <laughs> um, but just being in that country was, was enough because you started to understand so much more around you were constantly being immersed in, in the, what from a foreign perspective is nonsense or crazy um, culture. But the more you're immersed in it, the more you understand, the more you understand it the better you can be as a translator. And I was, I was talking with a colleague of mine just yesterday, actually, and he, he was just leaving the business. Um, well, he, he left the business, so it was my colleague who was talking about it. And, and she said, he said the one thing he learned about his time working with Audible in Japan was the importance of speaking up and, um, and not just accepting what's coming from the US because it's a very hierarchical culture in Japan and so often they they didn't they it didn't even come to their mind that they'd be like they'd be like, hey Chimon, I'm headquarters here, you should do this. And it didn't even it, it doesn't necessarily even occur to them to be like, oh I don't think that's the right thing to do here. And what I was able to do working in Japan was sit like in between head office here and the Japan team there and translate on that way and backwards to try and help mm -hmm. uh, help help the Americans understand how to be successful in Japan and help the Japanese understand how to communicate what they need to do to be successful. And it's our fastest growing marketplace now. So I'm really pleased about that. It's something I did other than helping them to better understand. Yeah, uh, I can only imagine what the cultural shifts might be like. Um, it's interesting you talking about going to India and that kind of being this kind of golden opportunity, right for uptake. Yeah. No major issues there. Yeah. Or I mean, I mean there, there, there are plenty of issues there. There's different issues. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? Well, there's just not as much money there as you want there to be. And so, and, and businesses are kind of like, there's a billion people there. Like, there, there is a billion people there. Um, and some of the, you know, a good chunk of those people are working out where their next meal is coming from. Like, mm -hmm. not which audio book subscription service they're going to subscribe to. Um, but we adjust our model to make the free model advertising funded over there, which we okay. can help a lot. Also, you know, I think we think about India as one place, but the better thing to do is think about India like, like we do Europe, like it's full of different languages, full of different cultures. Uh, and um, and so, so, so those are some of the challenges there. You just have, the, 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 the biggest challenge in India is the opportunity is huge, but the payoff point is unclear. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, how much do we invest before that payoff comes, I think it's one of the things we all get to this So if you're thinking about Audible in a place like India and you're wondering, because it's kind of a, almost like an experimental marketplace for a Western yep. company to come into India and decide this is going to be our business model and it's worked over in America and yep. other Western countries that might work in Asia as well, but it's actually not that simple. Yes. What other kinds of companies are you, are you when you say there's lots of other businesses trying to figure out the Indian market, what other t is it? Is it more business model based or is it technology based? Well, I think I think it's um, I think it's all of those things and, 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 and much more. You know, I think that we we work very closely with the Prime Video team in, in mm -hmm. India around what content they were creating, how much content they were creating. Uh, and which audiences they're trying to reach, uh, and, and trying to tap in is, is a few massive cultural things in India. You know, cricket, obviously, is like just bigger than you, bigger than you can even imagine. Um, Bollywood, a 
again, bigger than you can possibly imagine. The stars there are just huge. And we got we, we were really fortunate to work with some of the big stars around some of our launches in India. Uh, and then um, uh, and the other thing is like spirituality is a huge category there. So uh, from a from an entertainment perspective, we were trying to play around with those three areas and work out what was, was going to be right and what was interesting. Um, and, and where to invest, but it's very expensive to get into those those spaces because they are they are truly mainstream properties mm -hmm. in a truly massive country plus one billion uh, in the country, and then there's the, the whole global gap as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and then talking about moving say from India to Japan and now to Europe. I'm kind of thinking maybe you get to Europe and you think there can't be anything I haven't seen already when it comes to it's cultural differences of business it's models. So uh, what are some of the surprises you've seen in, in Europe? Um, oh, so many. Uh, different, do you know what one of my biggest, so, so I, I'll give you a couple of things. The, the Europeans have a very, I think we laugh at the Americans and think that they work so hard um, and that they don't take holidays. We are so much closer to the Americans than the Europeans. Like the Europeans will, they go on, they go on holidays and just like the out of office is on the moment they walk into work and they just, they don't, they don't, they don't, nothing, nothing ever is checked. And that might, that, and, and I think that this is good, but don't, don't, don't take this, any of this as criticism. But it was quite an adjustment for where you're coming from. Japan, where people work very, very hard, uh, and, um, and and also Australia, where I think people work very, very hard. But in in Europe, people like at six o'clock they'll, they'll turn off. They, they don't have email on their phone. They don't check their emails or anything like that out of hours. Um, or if they're sick, they, they they're not checking any of those things. They have like they they all go on holidays all at the same time. But that was quite surprising for me at first. I guess I'm just like. I, I, I sound quite like it's like God, you know, we need to work on what we're doing. But, but when I got there, I was like, oh wow, like you're on leave, but the person underneath is on leave, and then, like, oh wow, you're all on leave. Who's <laughs> <laughs> answering the phone? Who's answering the bloody phone? <laughs> um, and then like, that was cool because we're all on holiday. <laughs> And, and, and at first I was kind of like, oh my gosh, this is really bad, but it, it, it's just a, so, so that was a massive shift. And then I think also, you know, I'll use the same analogy. I think we look at the American political system and think, oh my gosh, that is so right wing. They don't have things like universal health care and this and that. But when I think about our, uh, our mindset around, I guess, left and right conservative versus um, more liberal, um, liberal in the liberal party yep. left wing. Um, we are, I feel like we are much closer to the US than, than, um, than Europe as well. And I, the other example I'll give there is just around the mindset of employment law and the relationship between workers and the company. And in, in Europe, there's this mindset that you know, Siobhan, if you're the boss, you have to really care for me as an employee. You have to um, you have to look after me. You should be you should be focused on my well-being. But me, me as the employee, I I, I don't owe you anything. I don't owe you anything other than the fair minimum that's in my contract. And um, and. Employment law is super, super strong on the side of the of the, um, of the employee, and so that is that. What what has been an adjustment for me in Europe is that, and I think that we do that at least if you work for a multinational company, you come and to head office in the US a lot of the time. Like, right? okay, so this so this and so that, I don't care, I don't care, and that's kind of how the Europeans have viewed me, especially in coming in as the boss of the team over there. That at first I was like, oh God, he doesn't want us all to be on holidays at some time. He, he, he's, he's concerned about, you know, that we don't have email on our phone. And so, yeah, I felt like I felt like that American 
how we should be this data. So I've had to adjust that. At the end of the day, though, is it that hard an adjustment of cutting out? Well, I don't know. When you have a deep seated, I think yeah. a, a really core value of mine is responsiveness. Yeah. And so um, I still have an email on my phone. Yeah. Um, so and you're constantly checking it, aren't you? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, hard, it's, it's It's, yeah, but it's, it's not a problem for that. I don't see that as a problem, but maybe that's. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, God forbid you get, you get to Spain, you have to take a siesta in Well, yeah, well, I go to Spain a lot, and they, and they all want to go out for lunch in the middle of the yeah, day. Back two hours, hours. Yeah, they take it. But it's a good fun. Um, so, so, just wrapping up, I guess, that um, cultural change and uh, leading teams across different locations around the world. Have you got any kind of key strategies or insights that you might be able to share with the room around how you can build and lead happy teams when you're dealing with all of these different cultural norms? Yeah, so I'll say a couple of things to that. First and foremost, um, when you are from a, when you are from a place, you are so much more deeply connected to that place than um, you know so much more about that place than, than anyone else. And so people from Newcastle will be able to tell you all the differences about Newcastle versus um, and, and there are, there's lots. But the reality is that um, in, in aggregate, the behavior of a single person versus a Newcastle person it, the, the difference might be 5%, and I think that when you're from a place, you focus on the differences rather than the commonalities. And, um, and I think what I've noticed across all of these marketplaces, and I'll use the example of our servers, we look at the user data and see how much people listen to, when they listen, what they listen to, or what have you. And what we find is enormous similarities across all of the marketplaces. However, the people in the marketplaces, all they want to tell me about is the differences between Sydney and Newcastle. Um, or what are, what are those things? Because that's, they're so deep in it that that's all they can see. They, you know, as a Spaniard, you can tell what's different about the French experience and doing business than it is the Spaniard. And what coming in from the outside, what I've seen is it's like, sure, there are differences, I don't want to discount that. There's eight percent the same. Yeah. Uh, and you can see that in the data. And so what I've tried to do, what I've really tried to do is become fluent in data. Um, because it's when you look at the user data and behavior, you can start to see, you start to see that things that aren't as different as they might appear on the outside. And then by leading through data, you're able to have, you're, you're able to, you're able to lead. Because if, if, if you're trying to lead a, a Spaniard, and um, you, you, you've got to have the proof points to prove why what you want to do is better, because I, otherwise the argument degenerates so quickly into well, I'm from here, and I can't get things are done here, and it's just not helpful. So I think the data has been really important. The other thing, and, and it's something I'm constantly trying to work on, is how do you how do you take time? To listen, how do you take time to really listen and understand a perspective before making a decision? I think that particularly Australians, because when, in our working environments, resources are often constrained, we don't have the budget perhaps to do deep, deep research, or maybe we are spread across you know, what in the other businesses would be five or six people is one person because it's a generalist kind of business mindset here and we just don't have the number of people. We're okay making decisions that we're not an expert on and, 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 and making those decisions fast. And I think what I've tried to learn and I'm constantly trying to learn and I've got a lot to do is how do you slow down and listen and you know, make decisions. And that's what I'm looking for. Is it the thing that you're working on? It's good, it's good, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. it's great to be right a lot, and that can be like, and, that, and I think in my career that has certainly really well. You, you know, we, we went right.
brought on staff in an environment where we didn't know what to do and, and I made mistakes but also did get a lot right and so when you get used to being right a lot, um, you've got to be careful. The, the more senior you get and the more further away from the environment you're an expert in that you're operating in, you might still get a lot right, but the stakes are higher when you get them wrong. Mm -hmm. and, so, and I guess that goes back to the importance of the team, right? right. Like their, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Create, surrounding yourself with correct. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to step away from some questions around your career trajectory and talk more specifically about now Audible, the yes. company. So for those in the room that aren't familiar with Audible, can you explain a little bit about its business model and, um, yeah, a brief outline of the company. Sure. I mean, Audible is an Amazon company. It's the world's largest uh, provider of audio books and um, spoken word content, so they have podcasts and audio books, uh, and live theatre readings and, and um, and so we are available in 11 markets globally. We just launched in Brazil uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and um, it's, it's, a, it's primarily a subscription based business. Um, and and so, 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 no ads, you pay a monthly subscription. Um, it's app based, and so you've got all your content on the phone. Uh, and we work with we work with publishers um, and we record all the books. Every book is recorded by a, a, an actor. Um, sometimes there's multiple actors and, and we're now working to create our own content. So we, we're both a marketplace, so we sell other people's works. So um, Penguin Random House has a book, they record it, they sell it on our um, marketplace. We commission work, so we, sorry, we, we, we're a publisher, so we buy the audio rights for certain good books. And also we're a commission, so we create original works. And so we'll be working with Marvel, or with Disney, um, DC, uh, and, and a vast variety of people uh, here. Um, Mark Fanoa, we do a lot of work here in Australia to create original podcasts that exist as well. Okay. Um, so I've got a question here from the audience, which is a nice little follow-up on everything you've asked before. Um, what's the world record for Audible? Uh, look, we have, um, there's, there are people that seem to just do nothing else. This seems to horrible. And I guess sometimes I look at some roles, like, you know, so some jobs like a, a, a person that's in a, a, you know, a, a parking office attendant or something like that. Or, um, and I was like, that would be perfect. You could just be listening all, all day, right? Or, um, you know, there's, so, so, so there's people that listen all the time. There's, there's, Literally billions and billions of hours um, that are listened to. Like the, the tech infrastructure we have to deliver all that stuff's pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, so there's, there's people that, that seem to do nothing else. <laughs> and uh, those people listening at Deep Yeah, I saw that question. Um, yeah, it's some, some people do. I, 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 I only listen one, um, but I tried some different things. I actually got up to three. Um, and I, I equate this to like um, it's like some, listening to someone with an accent. Sometimes you know, <laughs> it's like the first first you hear someone with an accent, and then then maybe I've, I've got a brother in law who's French, and so when I'm about to see him, I'm like whoa, whoa, whoa! But then about half an hour, I feel like you change your hearing, and it's a little bit like that. So you can kind of move it up. Three is probably a little bit ridiculous, but, uh, but yeah, there, there are. People. I'm one and a half speed up. You're one and a half? Yeah. Okay. And when I go, it goes back to one, I'm like, oh, yeah, it's been so smart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so uh, we've got another question here around um, the perspective of what's your perspective on audio books influencing or impacting written content consumption? Is that something that you think about? Um, well, yeah, absolutely, because it's something the publishers think about. What we know is the people that listen to Audible, um, you know, it doesn't count a lot of book sales, but they, they, they typically increase it. So it's, um, a lot of our customers are people that love books and want to read books, uh, and they use Audible when they can't be, they can't be readers, or when they're driving, or when they're in the parking in the office, or, or um, when they're exercising, or when they're cleaning the home, or something like that. So um, it's not, it doesn't count a lot. What we've seen is that audiobooks is what's growing the publishing sector at the moment. That's where the growth is coming from for those publishers. Uh, and so um, 
it's, 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 it's a good thing. It doesn't, it doesn't, it, it, one doesn't get the other. Yeah. Um, you touched a little bit before on the differences or the similarities rather between audio and podcast listening habits yeah. across multiple different countries. Yeah. Are there any glaring differences that you see? Um, no, not necessarily. Yes, yes and no, and no and yes. So, and, and some of that is just down to the maturity of the podcast market oh, in, in various countries. Because I think we, we say podcast, but that it doesn't mean one thing. Right? Yeah. An audio book, I think, does mean more one thing. It's like it's a book that's read to you. But a podcast can be anything from you know two people in their garage talking about the their favourite football team, right through to an amazing soundscape design, um, uh, Dolby Atmos experience with 10 actors and, mm -hmm. and, and what have you. So podcast is, 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 a, is a spectrum, I guess, is what I would say. And where we want to play in that podcast, podcast space is really up in that high-end space. Um, and so, we, you know, we're working with, with, with some top name film directors to, to come in and, uh, and, and create truly phenomenal soundscapes for us where we have, again, top name uh, actors uh, performing for us. Uh, and, um, and so what we're starting to see is that the audience is growing in that space and dropping away in the two people. Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. And because I think people, um, they, they just, there's just so much of that low end, and I think it's yeah. like a high end where the opportunity is. I guess it's a little bit like, uh, you, you know, when I, when I, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, we talked about bloggers, and we don't really talk about that anymore because it was a college industry that we did. And, then, and now those, those, the, the successful bloggers kind of are indistinguishable now from mainstream media outlets. I think that that's where it's going to be in space for podcasting as well. Yeah, I haven't thought about the evolution of podcasts in that way because I'm, I'm, I'm still listening to those one or two podcasts. I think that there, there's definitely that, but what you're, you're going to start to see, there's some genres that are openly indexed in podcasts like true crime. Oh God, yes. Uh, and I think that... I don't need any more I, I, yeah, I don't think anybody does. I think all the crimes are solved. Um, and so, and I, I think you're going to start to see many more of those genres because podcasting was, was kind of niched in a couple of genres. And I think what we're starting to see now, like right, we've just done something in the US where it was like a talent show for like a voice. And so we're trying to unlock that. I think you'll start to see more of those genres. Oh, okay, that sounds really cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you always hear about people who have a face for radio. I feel like there's this... That's where I'm going. That's where I'm going. You definitely have one for audio, Matthew. Well, I'm just thinking there's this huge talent of people who are amazing um, verbal storytellers yes. that maybe you might never make it as an actor or uh, a television host yes. uh, or even a YouTuber. Yeah. Um, that it opens up this huge career possibility for people who, yeah. you know, or may not want to be the face of something, right? Um, yeah, and just different, uh, I guess, career opportunities for actors to be yeah. able to play these roles. Correct. And, like radio, what we, what radio my parents would have known as radio. Yeah, radio yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's super fascinating. Okay, I'm just checking my watch. Went, whoa, okay, I'm going to um, hand it over to the audience in a second. But I just did want to touch on the idea of. Um, <laughs> Uh, language barriers being those obstacles <clears throat> to um, the area that you're working in. Um, so, how do you help individuals overcome these barriers and sort of foster more effective um, intercultural communication? Yeah, I mean, we are so fortunate as English speakers that um, that's the language that translates right. And so, um, the work I do in Germany is in English, and it was the same. In um, it's, I, I, I speak a little German, a little, a little Japanese, and a lot better. But um, the business is done, done in English. Mm. So, and, and what I'm starting to see across all businesses is that increasingly English is becoming dominant. And I, I don't know whether there's a backlash against that in certain, you know, maybe Europe's will have a little But um, what 
I, I mentioned data before, and I think that that's the way that, that I try to use that because as a native English speaker, I'm always going to be much more eloquent at making my arguments. But the data doesn't lie, the numbers don't lie. So what, where we try to make decisions in, and, and how we decide, and it's a very Amazonian thing, but the numbers make the decisions for you yeah. and, and the numbers speak louder than words. And so by being, creating an environment where data rules is Yeah. And teaching the team, what I'm focused on is teaching the team how to speak data um, because it's, it, that's going to be much more powerful than, than being eloquent in English. Obviously, they need to be able to communicate and understand in English enough, but data is where the power is. Yeah, I don't want that impression for people that can speak anything other than English at another time. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're very privileged to be able to go to the It's an internal privilege yeah. that we don't, and we don't realize how. How, I think one of the things I've learned is, what you don't realize is that for the audience members that aren't natural native English speakers, they're having to work so much harder, okay. and, and they're probably only picking up, the, well, they may only be picking up 70% of what's being said, and, and so the, the cognitive load is so much higher. Yeah. Especially at one and a half Um So I'm going to ask one more question and then, and then we'll throw it to the audience. So, um, you know, Audible's been the driving force in audiobooks and now into podcasts. And I'm guessing there's going to be a lot of competitors that are going to be really buying for that pie. Um, can you share what your vision for the industry is in, in the coming years and, and, and what, what Audible's role is going to be in that? Yeah, that's a great, that's, that's a great question. I think what I would say is um, it's just the start. Um, you know, I mentioned genres before around podcasting, that there's certain genres that are over-indexed and others that, that are not. Um, and I think as we get busier, and as I think particularly as parents, a lot of people are very conscious of not their children not having too much screen time and what have you. And I think that there is huge opportunities for us to exploit um,
if that can be automatized, uh, if that can be digitized and, 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 and happens immediately, that's where I think the, uh, those opportunities will be unlocked. Um, I think the the challenge is where how did it, there's no commerciality in that, and so what 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 businesses or what government can do as well to help foster that because you obviously have to train the, the models around how to speak uh, and it's, it's a complicated process for how you create it. Yes, well, it's, it's less commercially related than commercial. It's not commercial, it's yeah. yeah. It, is, it is culturally significant. Yeah, yeah, it, it is. So it's not something we're looking at. Right. Um, my theory is that um, no, the, the, the global um, the, the global print sales and ebook sales are still higher than they are um, in audio. And is there a percentage of the pie? Uh, yeah, there is a very wide marketplace, but what we're starting to see is that the, the pie for audio is growing rapidly, so it's rapidly catching up. Uh, is, is, is what I would say, and that's where the growth is coming from. And, you know, I mentioned it before, audiobooks aren't necessarily coming at the expense of, it's not that the, the pie is staying the same size and the audio segment is growing, um, it's growing the pie. Uh, and so it's, it's catching up. Obviously, there's certain genres that just don't work, like cookbooks in audio that work so well, and that, but that's a big category, I mean, children, picture books are a big category and so but um, when it comes to things like um, romance and fiction and thriller um, yeah, we do really compete and, and that's incredible. And, and the question is the Europeans listen to more audible on <laughs> They do. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah that's why yeah that's why we've got to work hard before the holidays start. <laughs>
in Australia, it's a little tricky because we don't have ACX in Australia at the moment. Yeah. Um, Can you just explain what that is? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, it's so uh, ACX is uh, Audible Content Creator Issue. So you, it's like Kindle Direct Publishing, so you can self-publish. Yeah. And we don't have that in Australia. It's, 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 for, it's for good reason. It's just prioritisation of things. Sure. Yeah. Um, so yeah, sorry. Yeah. So, so what are the publishing pathways for Australian authors? Like, is it is it through agents? Is it through like how does it? Through it agents, through publishers, yeah. yeah, typically. Yeah, through agents, through publishers at, at the moment. Right. Um, I expect in the near future there will be some publishing platform and, and opportunities to get into the space. Um, and there, there are providers now, and I think that, you know, I've, I've spoken a little bit about text to speech, and that's going to blow the whole thing. So yeah, right. I, I would say this may be radically different than even talking Yeah, right. Yeah, and so, and, and so I you're talking about text to speech shares as well. Yeah, you think that we should buy shares. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. In Japan, you want to go red up or in the Yeah, maybe. Yeah, hi. Um, I have a question. Um, I too like to listen to the podcast that you're on okay. like four months ago. Okay. Um, and in that podcast, you talk about busy humans consuming yeah. content. So I'm curious to know from your experience with the book, how, how do you help me work through the World of um, options and choices yeah. to make a choice. Of what does all think about now? How am I going to pick? You mean title selection? Yeah, or yeah, what, how? We need to be better at that, if I'm honest. Okay. Um, we need to be better at that, and we need to be better at our uh, our algorithms need to be better, better at predicting what content we want. And what we need to do. They're getting better all the time, like the, the, the technology there is phenomenal. Um, and we just released a, a new algorithm recently in Europe that has had like a you know thirty percent increase on revenue. So it's just those fixing those things will work. Um, and and so you know we have we have like what we call King of the Hill style carousels of top sellers, but then we do have personalised um, searches as well. It should be getting better all the time. I, I don't think that's good enough, frankly. We're going to have to wrap it up now, I'm afraid. But, oh, one that's quick question, Sarah. Oh, Zora, sorry. sorry. <laughs> um, audible and wear, tech and wearables, are you guys launching into that at all? Uh, no. Um, we played around with stuff around sleep. We were looking at sleep for a long time. Um, and I think that, you know, back to the question before around indigenous languages, there's, there's so many things we could do, um, but Austra you know, and, and this is what I'm really pleased as a business with. I mean, we used to do 100 things, and when you try to do 100 things, you don't do them all very well. And so the, the art of strategy is working out what you're not going to do. And, and, That's not right. Yeah, and, and tech, where are the techs going? Like, we were looking at sleep, sleep yeah, a lot. It's because it's more of a gamification. Yeah, sure. And there was also like I, you know, I, I had a meeting with someone that was like, I've got this vest that you can put on, and so if you know if you're listening to a talk and like someone gets shot, like you can feel it. I was like, I was like, that sounds great, but I was like, I don't know if I want to do that. Pop my jacket on. Tell my story. Yeah, right, yeah. I don't even want to feel that. So yeah, we're not, we're not, we're not looking at wearables just now. But you know, we're. Our focus is how do we integrate into all technology. So we're on like things like Apple Watch and your phone. And so it's, it's how do we appear where the, the, the people that will do a great job of that are. Well, let's give a round of applause to you.